It's 1915, and three immigrants have just stumbled onto an invention that's going to change the trajectory of animation as we know it. Their names are Joe, Dave, and Max. Dave worked as a clown in Coney Island, and they've been using that skit as the center testing piece for the entire project. Dave would put on his costume and perform his skit, and then Joe and Max would film the skit. After processing the film, they would put it into their new invention, which would project each individual frame onto a glass slide. Once the film was projected, Max could go in and trace all of David's movements. He did this for each frame, and then he played all the frames back. These are the Fletcher brothers, and they have just invented rotoscoping. So today we're going to talk about the animation landscape of the 10s and 20s. We'll follow Max Fletcher as he begins his career, and then we'll end the video around when the silent era ends. Today we're going to talk about the more technical aspects of the things that were going on, and then next time we're going to go back, cover the same time period, and talk about it from the production company's point of view. Both of these videos are going to cover around the same time period, 1915 to the late 1920s, 1929 to put a specific date on it. Yes, I took my hoodie off. Sue me. In the mid to late 1910s, vaudeville still had some life to it, but now there was a serious competitor, silent movies. Just like when we made the jump from cave art to hieroglyphics, audiences now wanted longer forms of entertainment. They demanded longer stories, and silent movies were what could give those audiences what they wanted. Unfortunately, the first silent movie of note is D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. That movie. Terrible movie, terrible idea, terrible premise, terrible. The reason we're talking about that movie right now is because it had proper editing in 1915, a full five years before the rest of the country caught up. D.W. Griffith was an unapologetic racist who framed the Klansmen as the good guys in his movie, but he did invent some editing techniques that would take about five years for everyone to catch on to, and now everybody uses them today. Thankfully, not all of his contemporaries shared his same racist ideologies. By 1920, silent movies started coming out consistently, and some of them were actually kind of fun. As stars like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin would begin to get their rise, vaudeville would start to fade into the background. Vaudeville's one and only saving grace is that the silent movies were... silent. They didn't have audio, which meant you can't have singers, musicians, you can't have stand-up comedians, you can't tell an anecdote, you have to read it. Vaudeville gave them their platform, and as long as movies couldn't do that, vaudeville was safe. It wasn't until 1928 when we started seeing sound on film technology being produced that vaudeville was doomed. Towards the end, vaudeville stars were being approached by movie producers who would offer them one-time payoffs to perform their act in front of a camera. With the biggest names in vaudeville filming their acts, with sound on film technology becoming more widespread, and with the Great Depression, vaudeville was dead by the late 30s. Now, animations were still played in vaudeville right up until its death, but someone got the idea that these animations could play in front of the movie theaters. They'd play these cartoons on a loop while they waited for the crowd to be ushered in. You could think of them the same way we think of movie trailers today. When you sit down and you're waiting for the movie to start, you have something to keep you entertained, but it's not the reason you're there. You're there for the silent movie. The animation that's playing before it is just a novelty. Animation was too expensive and too experimental for live action films to rely on it consi- Hello. It's all good. Thank you. I got my hoodie back. It's not a continuity error if I acknowledge it. Animation was still too expensive for live action production companies to rely on it consistently. So, for the most part, animation ended when the movie began. Now, that's not to say there weren't a couple of exceptions. Franco Cristaldi used stop motion as the punchline in Pool Sharks in 1915. But for the most part, animation became a bunch of one-off serialized jokes that would play while people went to go get their popcorn. At that time, comic strips were exploding in popularity. Newspaper companies wanted to promote these comic strips, so what they would do is they would hire animation production companies to make cartoons of their characters. These were the cartoons that would play before the silent movies. And when you think of them this way, it's less about being entertaining in their own right, and more about being an advertisement for the newspapers. Advertisements don't typically have credits. Think about any commercial. Somebody had to write it, star in it, shoot it. Someone worked the audio, someone edited it, someone... It was produced and distributed, and none of that is ever credited in a commercial. They thought of cartoons the same way. So all of the artists and the animators who worked on the cartoon don't get credit. All of the credit goes to whoever created the initial character, even if that person had nothing to do with the animation. 
These animations were incredibly effective, and comic strips became a big hit because of it. Speaking of being a hit, there was a little bit of a war going on at this time. Some rando took out an underrated band, and now all of Europe is in a little bit of a tussle. Boo doo 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 doo. -doo. The question of if America should throw her helmet into the ring became a widely debated topic. And if we look to our right, we'll see Windsor McKay slowly pushing America into World War I on the side of the British. This is the same Windsor McKay that gave us Gertie the Dinosaur, How a Mosquito Operates, and Little Nemo. After his vaudeville days, he left his post at the New York American and became an animator full-time, pretty much just living off the royalties of Gertie. He pursued this as a passion project. For context, that's a German submarine, that's a British liner, and those are Americans on the ship. America at the time was neutral, so this was kind of a big deal. In the Germans' defense, they said that the ocean liner was carrying war supplies from North America to Britain. Now, the British denied that. It, they were lying, but they, they did deny it at the time. So there's a lot more going on in the historical context of this animation, but the animation itself is pure, unapologetic propaganda. And on top of being propaganda, it was also an animated version of a historical event. There were no cameras at that time, and I think that's important. This, the sinking of the Lusitania, was a real event that had real-life impact on a lot of people. And the best they had of it at the time were drawings. So seeing a fully fledged out animation of the entire attack was groundbreaking. It brought to life a tragedy for thousands, if not millions of people that only a couple hundred actually saw. Shortly after becoming production supervisor at Bray Studios, Max Fleischer moved to Fort Sill where he worked on army training videos. These training videos covered everything from submarine mine laying to contour map reading to operating the Stokes mortar to firing the Lewis machine gun. Post edit Russell here. Uh, apparently these videos have all been either lost to time or the military has them locked up in a vault somewhere. Either way, I'm not in the military, so I don't have access to these. Now, I haven't found any earlier examples of animation being used like this for training let alone for the military. This is life and death situations. If you don't know how to operate a Stokes mortar and you are a mortar operator in World War I, that's probably a bad thing. Animation was now being used to teach. Now the animation pipeline is such a big hassle that most people don't want to go through with it. But do you know what people do want to go through with? This video sponsor. Just kidding doesn't sponsor me. Yet. Oh this? This is just my world map. You see, I foolishly got this dry erase board of the world assuming that it was going to be legible. As you can see, I was laughably mistaken. Here's a digital version instead. So this is the new and improved world map. Each video in this series has a start and end date in my notes that I'm going to cover chronologically. Whenever we get to a new section of time, I'm going to update this map and include animations from all over the world. Now, I'm not going to say that America is the only country that actually matters, but it's the most important one, and it's where I live, so I'm going to focus on it. America, America. That said, I don't want to discredit all the amazing work that's happening outside of the United States. I already put the ant and the grasshopper and Gertie the dinosaur in Russia and America, respectively. Each video I'm going to update this map to include every country that's released its first animation. When we eventually get to feature length movies, I'm going to reset the map and we're going to just cover the first movie that they make. Hopefully this breaks the shell of, oh, we're always in America. Because if I didn't have this, we probably would be. So far all the animations that I've talked about this episode have come from somewhere between Maine and California, so it's nice to welcome France to the world stage. Produced and directed by Emile Cole, Phantasmagory came out in 1908. Now I see a lot of sources saying that Phantasmagory is the first animation. I disagree. In my last video I said that one of my qualifiers was that you need a named character inside the context of your own animation. Phantasmagory is more like a dream sequence. It's really cool, but I don't think it tells a story. I think it's more practice of the technical side of animation. So in regards to it being the world's first animation, I don't think it meets the right definition by either metric. Either you take my previous definition, in which case it's ruled out because it doesn't have a named character or a story, or you qualify the first animation as any animation whatsoever, 
and in which case it would probably go to humorous faces of funny faces which came out a full two years before that. I'd be really interested to see why some people believe this. Uh, I, I think there's definitely a case to be made but for my purposes I'm just gonna say this is the first animation that France came out with and the first real cartoon was still Gertie the Dinosaur. Both Phantasmagory and Humorous Faces of Funny Faces were shot onto negatives, which give them that distinctive blackboard look. Eventually, they started shooting them onto positive, which inverts the value and gives us the cartoon look that we know today. So there's France. And it seems that Japan is pretty eager to get on this animation thing too. Let's see if it's anime yet. A series of short films were produced by Kobayashi Shokai Limited. They were called The Dull Sword. They were released in Japanese theaters sometime in 1917. Just to give you an idea of how old this is, the final battle with samurai in it took place in the spring of 1877. The samurai had only been gone for about 40 years at this point, so it's very possible that animators met real samurai. These shorts were a huge hit in the land of the rising sun, and animation production companies would begin to appear there, much like in America. I wouldn't consider this anime quite yet, but this is where those production companies will get their start. So. Why Hollywood? In the very beginning of film history, most movie production companies were in New York and New Jersey. It looked like New York was going to be our modern day Hollywood. For the sole reason, that's where Tommy Projector lived. He filed all of his patents for the camera and the projector there. So New York, New Jersey, that was kind of the area to be if you wanted to produce movies, for a while at least. Well, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was this pilgrimage west. There's a little event called the California Gold Rush where a couple of people got very, very rich very quickly. Those people then turned around and put their money into film production companies. With the patents, Edison was able to charge these expensive user fees that no one could really get around. That was until someone decided to travel down the Oregon Trail and realized that Tommy's not going to follow them out there that far. It's a long, dangerous trip. And at the end of it, he might be able to make some money back. Yes, he was in the right legally, but that's not just hop a plane and go. That is sit for months at a time. So for all intent and purposes, Hollywood was just outside of his jurisdiction. He couldn't enforce anything there. Now, to produce these films, you need more than just a guy and his camera. You need actors, directors, writers for the script, producers. Someone needs to design the set, and then someone needs to make that design. Not just that, these people need to eat, that's catering, film needs to be developed, that's a totally different problem altogether. You need a full society to keep this infrastructure working. Hollywood offered the perfect opportunity for that society to bloom. With all the people that moved west and didn't strike it lucky in the gold rush, they are all looking for jobs now and they might be able to build the sets. There was no shortage of manual labor, and on top of that, as word spread that this is where the movies were being made, it drew in more creative people. People that designed better sets, created better costumes, made better movie posters. All people looking for a chance to just earn a living through movies. And they got it. Hollywood was already the perfect spot geographically to start filming too. Hollywood itself was the perfect setting for a western which became very popular in the 50s. If you want to go to the mountains, you just go a little bit to the east, and if you go any further east of that, you get desert. If you want to experience a different culture, you just go a little south and you get the beautiful landscapes of Mexico. To the west, you have the entire Pacific coast. Any beachfront property you want to shoot on is there. If you go north, you hit Oregon, and if you hit, go a little further north, you could even get all the way up to Seattle. I mean, look at how great it is here. And there's about a dozen national parks that are just littered all over California. Hollywood became a mix of cultures and identities that was just absolutely perfect for this industry to grow. So film production companies started moving to California almost immediately. Animation, on the other hand, didn't exactly need that geographic benefit, so it took a little bit longer to move. In the very beginning of animation, it stayed in that comfort zone of, we're just going to pay Tommy his legal fees and forget about it. They stayed in New York, they just dealt with it. Animation was pretty under the thumb of Tommy Electric Pen, and until his death in 1931, there really wasn't a good way for them to escape those legal fees. Animation wasn't consistent enough to move the same way film did, but by the 30s, there was a good mix on both the East and the West Coast. From an overview, the animation pipeline requires two companies. You need the production company and the distribution company. So the production company, they're the ones that actually make the animation. They go through, they draw all the frames, they make the backgrounds, they put it all together, and they make one final product, 
which they then give to the distribution company. The distribution company will then copy the product and send it across the states, which is what gets the cartoons in front of the viewers. The rights to the animations were weird as well. Back when animation was first starting off, they would not feature original characters. The characters were typically taken directly from a comic strip, and the animation was more seen as a way to advertise the comic strip for the newspaper. It wasn't the main event. The main event was the comic strips, which at the time were just selling like hotcakes. The animation was more of a way to get people to look at the comic strip. Because of that, there would be rights for the character's comic appearance, and then rights for the character's animation appearance, and then sometimes they would claim both rights, and sometimes they'd claim neither, and it was, it was just an absolute mess, and it, it still is today. Typically, the rights would go directly to whoever created the character first, but there were also occasions where it would go to whoever commissioned the character. In the early days, animation was an incredibly thankless job. You had long hours, late nights, hard shifts where you had to throw away chunks of animation, start over the next day, low pay, and... In the end, the only person to be credited was the guy that made the initial cartoon that probably never touched the animation in the first place. As we go through the series, we're going to see the title of animator start to gain some more respect, some more notability. The late night's hard work and low pay is still very much the same as it was in the 1910s. It's this landscape that Max Fleischer is going to make his debut into the animation world. Max was born in 1883 to a Jewish family in Krakow, Austria now Poland. He was the second of six children and the son of a tailor. The family changed their name from Tarnowska to Fleischer when they immigrated to New York in 1887. He received commercial art training at Cooper Union and then formal art training at the Art Students League of New York. His first job was at the Brooklyn Eagle. He started with photography and then moved to photo engraver and then eventually cartoonist. He worked his way up the ladder from single panel editorial cartoons all the way up to full comic strips. Little Algy and S.K. Spluner were satirical strips that he created that were based on his life growing up in Brownsville, New York. This is where he met John Randolph Bray, who would eventually give him his start in the animation industry, but Bray isn't quite in the industry himself at this point, so it'll come a little later in the story. In 1905, he married his childhood sweetheart, S.E. Goldstein. He took jobs in Boston, Massachusetts, then Syracuse, New York, and then finally back to New York City, where he became an editor for Popular Science Magazine. By 1914, the first cartoons started appearing in theaters. Most of them were stiff and rigid. They weren't as fluid as Windsor McKay's Gertie. Now, this is just because the principles that we know today weren't invented yet. People were still trying to figure them out. But Fleischer had an idea. He saw movies and he understood that movies were just a bunch of pictures over each other. So what happens if you just trace those pictures? Would you get a fluid animation? And the answer is, yeah, sorta. The first tests for the rotoscope were done between 1914 and 1916. And by 1917, the Fleischers had their full patent. Let's talk about rotoscoping for a second because there's a lot of pros and cons to it. In most animation, moving characters are what's called shot on twos. Now what this means is that for every one drawing, there are two frames. Now first instinct would suggest that it's better to have one drawing per frame, but actually holding the animation for that extra frame cuts back on the jittering of the final product. It also halves the number of drawings you need per production, so at 24 frames per second on twos, you only need 12 drawings. Now there are times where it's better to be animating on ones, Fast actions like punches and effects come to mind, but in general it's better to be on twos. It's cheaper and it is less jarring to look at. Right off the bat, you can't animate on twos in rotoscoping, you have to be on ones. The animation will just come off as flickery. If you animate on twos with rotoscoping, what you're looking at is essentially a movie where every other frame has been taken out. It looks wrong. And even when rotoscoping is done properly, it still has a tendency to come off as jittery and weightless. When you're animating traditionally, you're thinking about the weight of the character. You're thinking about the shape of the masses, where those masses are going, and how fast they're going there. With rotoscoping, all of that attention to the physics of the motion is completely lost. The animator is more concerned with tracing the outline of the character than they are with showing the actual motion that they're going through. That's why teachers can always tell when an art piece that's been turned in has been traced. The line work usually seems even, and objects, particularly cloth, look entirely weightless. Nevertheless, rotoscoping was still a huge leap forward in animation for its time because of how fast the animators could work. 
On top of that, a lot of principles that we know today hadn't really been conceived of yet. This was still the open frontier and people were still pioneering these ideas. Rotoscoping, even today, is a way to fake those principles. For a while, it seemed like rotoscoping was going to be the future of animation, but as time progressed, it ended up taking a backseat to the more traditional styles. Rotoscoping is still used today, but it's much less prevalent than it was in the 10s and 20s. Usually now, it's more of a stylistic choice. Fletcher's first attempt at producing anything came from Path Film Exchange, where he was working as a cutter since 1914. He wasn't going to let this opportunity go to waste. He had this idea in his head for a political satire based on a hunting trip by Teddy Roosevelt. For months, Max grinded away at these reels. He shot reference. He put it through the rotoscope. He had long, sleepless nights where he was painstakingly drawing every individual frame. He had to imagine a background behind him that would frame his character perfectly. And at the premiere, there was no premiere because the film was rejected months into production and months before it was ready. On the bright side, this did reunite Max with J.R. Bray. Bray had a distribution contract with Paramount and he was looking for a new production supervisor. It was shortly after this announcement that J.R. was approached by the American government to produce those training videos that I was talking about earlier. In 1918, Fleischer introduces the world to that project that he was working on in the beginning of this video. Now the first three films have been lost to time, but the fourth one, the first one that we actually still have record of is the clown's pup. Back then the character was just called the clown and he became an immediate smash hit. Rotoscoping just looked different than all the rest of the types of animation that were out there and it drew in more of a crowd. It was a novelty. Now Bray was a decent place for Fletcher to be working but by late 1919 J.R. Bray decided to trade the distribution rights from Paramount to Goldwyn. Almost immediately after trading the rights Goldwyn buys all of Bray's stocks out from under him and essentially takes over his production company. Goldwyn decides to ramp up production, going from four projects to ten. Now at first glance, this seems like a good thing. More projects means more animation, means more chances to animate, right? Well, not really. They were already stretched to their bare bones when they were at four productions, now they're at ten. Goldwyn did make Max the supervising director, but does that really matter if their expectations are that unrealistic? So due to the mistreatment of the distributor, Max left Bray and he took the clown with him. In 1921, Max and Dave, now out on their own, establish Out of the Inkwell Studios, which eventually is just turned to Inkwell Studios. So they continue production on the clown series through a couple of different distributors. So despite changing distributors often, there was always somebody who was willing to pick up that rotoscope show. Because of the consistency of rotoscoping, Fleischer was able to pass the production off to other people. In 1923, Fleischer started personally working on some technical and educational shorts. Specifically, Little Big Fellow and Now You're Talking with AT&T. He made two 20-minute shorts, one about Einstein's theory of relativity and another about Darwin's theory of evolution. Three years into this endeavor, the clown is given the name Coco by the newly signed animator Dick Humor. Let me make sure I'm not getting punked with that name. No? No, yeah, his, his name is Richard Humor and he went by Dick. That's legendary. It's also worth mentioning that Max assigned Art Davis as his assistant. Now, Dick was an industry vet at this point. He'd been working on an animation called Mutt and Jeff, which was doing pretty popular for itself. When he came in, he redesigned the entire show. He gave Coco his name, and he also gave him a pet dog named Fritz. Most importantly, Dick decided to move away from rotoscoping. Before, the production would rely on rotoscoping almost entirely, but now he started moving it away from rotoscoping. He only used it in very special situations if a camera angle was really tough or a specific action was just difficult to animate. In 1924, Max Fleischer partnered with Edmund Miles Fleitemann, Hugo Reisenfeld, and Lee DeForest to make Red Pictures Corporation. Is it the Red Pic... I don't know if it's the Red Pictures Corporation. I see it, I see it used both ways online, so I'm going to assume there's no the. I'm also going to wait for that Cessna to go away. That is a... Slow, slow flying Cessna. In 1924, Max Fleischer partners with Edwin Miles Feitemann, Hugo Rosenfeld, and Lee DeForest to make the Red Pictures Corporation. They end up owning about 36 theaters across the Northeast. Now, this is huge for Fleischer because he can basically cut out the middleman of a distributor for those 36 theaters. This is also around the time Fleischer invents the follow the bouncing ball technique. He produced a series of shorts known as Cartoon Songs, which 
was played with music that accompanied it. His cartoons would encourage the audience to sing along with the lyrics that were appearing on the screen, singing the bouncing ball lyric with the tune of the music that was playing. This was intended to help mask the fact that the music wasn't exactly synced with the animation properly. It also did raise audience attention rates. He doesn't realize this and he will never know how big this is going to be, but he just invented karaoke. <laughs> The 36 song cartoons went into production in 1926. Only 12 of these 36 shorts used DeForest's phonofilm sound on film technique, which allowed for rudimentary audio. They weren't synced properly yet, but this is still a huge leap forward. Unfortunately for Fleischer, Red Seal goes bankrupt a year into production and the entire product has to be shelved. Just five months later, the sound era would begin. After Red Seal fell, Fleischer was approached by Alfred Weiss, the owner of Artcraft Pictures. He had a contract to produce the cartoons for a new distributor, under the Artcraft name. Due to legal complications with the bankruptcy, out of the Inkwell became Inkwell Imps. Inkwell Imps ended up running from 1927 to 1929 under Artcraft Pictures for a new distributor. This began Fleischer's most paramount of professional relationships. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Artcraft was staying afloat, but in 1928, the landscape was about to change permanently. Disney casually drops Steamboat Willie, an animation with fully synchronized sound. This establishes Walt Disney and his company as an animation force to be reckoned with. Around the same time, Max and his brother Dave start experiencing mismanagement from Weiss over at Artcraft Pictures. They both leave the project and it was immediately followed by Inkwell Imps filing for bankruptcy in January of 1929. So Max and Dave Fleischer at this point are now very experienced animators, producers, and even inventors. They want to do something new. Coco the Clown got them their name, but they're ready to move on, move, tackle something tougher, stronger, something that isn't traced. Max still has his connections from Paramount at Red Seal. He can get a distributor. In 1929, the two brothers would open Fleischer Studios on Broadway in New York City. Now this is just Max's story. Next time we're gonna talk about the production companies behind them, the larger picture. We're gonna see poor companies grow from nothing and we're gonna see large companies go broke. Not sure how they go broke, they don't pay their animators, but they do. We're gonna see betrayal, rug pulls, People are going to spend their entire life savings just gambling on a chance, and maybe they make it. I hope you join me for that one. <laughs> uh, until then, take it easy. Yeah. <laughs>